Okay, so let's start it. Okay, so well, for those of you that just joined it, thank uh, thanks for joining the session. Um, I was just delivering another session right now about building your own connector with Cafe Connect, which is which was extremely demo centric, right, and code centric. This one's going to be a little bit more high level, right? So for those of you that know Kafka in a very high level, or maybe you don't know Kafka, I think this is going to be your thing, right? Um, Okay, so let me just set the connector here. So let me present again for those of you that was not in the first session. My name is Ricardo, right? I'm a developer advocate working in this company here called Elastic, right? You probably know Elastic from the Elastic stack, like uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Beats, and Logstash, right? Uh, at Elastic, I'm part of the community team, right? And um, I'm all open source. I mean, I love the technology that have been made available by open source, specifically the ones from Apache, right? That's one of the reasons why I, I decided to apply for this conference. And I'm a fan of Kafka, right? Uh, but you, 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 for those of you that know my career, I I've, I've, I've used to work at Confluent, which is one of the companies behind Kafka. So that's why I'm so e eager about the subject. And I'm also part of the Kafka Summit program committee member, right? That's uh, one of the things that I started doing last year. And those are my contacts, so rifery at elastic.co and rifery at rifery.com. If you want to contact me for anything that we cannot discuss here in the Q&A in the end, this is something that you can uh, also uh, reach out. And this is my Twitter handle, so all the slides will contain my Twitter handle. Uh, if you care to follow me on Twitter, from time to time, I usually share some good content over here, whether it's the talks that I've done or something that I've built, right? So without further ado, let's get started. I think if we ask anyone in the world right now about what their opinion about Kafka, they're going to say that Kafka is a messaging technology, right? They're, they're, it is no-brainer right there, right? Most of the people uh, think about this, but the reality is that Kafka is not a messaging technology, right? It looks like one, but it isn't, right? So... The best way I found it to explain what Kafka is, is using some of the passages from this book here called Kafka, the Definitive Guide. Um, this is probably one of the best resources for you to uh, learn Kafka in greater details. And one of the passages that is part of preface, which is, has been written by the one of the co-creators of Kafka, Jake Krabs, he said, uh, back his time when he was working on LinkedIn, he said, there was a lot of databases and other systems built to store data, but what's something missing in the architecture that would help us to handle continuous flows of data, right? So they had this need to handle continuous flows of data, and basically their realization is that, all right, we have this bunch of databases and technologies in place, but none of them seems to be very helpful for that, right? So let's talk about their, their story on LinkedIn so we can better understand what, where Kafka came from, right? So when they were building the architecture of LinkedIn, not LinkedIn specifically, but the architecture behind LinkedIn, right? The, the, the portal LinkedIn. Uh, they've decided that everything needs to be event-driven, right? So basically, if you if you have a care to see how LinkedIn works, or everything that LinkedIn does is to detect when an event happened, and then it is a queued some interested applications that are going to be are going to do something useful with that data, right? So, for example, you you jo you change jobs, you're gonna is a queued, for example the optimization of the search engine, right? Which is probably based on Elasticsearch, right? And this even driven architecture, right? Uh, when they were building fundamentally the first draft of the LinkedIn architecture, right? What they, what they saw at the time is that, right, let's not reinvent the wheel, right? Let's just use what everybody's doing for things like this. So let's use a SQL database for storing the data and then for, for the notification part, we're going to actually write a bunch of microservices that are going to execute SQL queries against the database to read the data from, right? Uh, right basically, that's 99% uh, of the developers on the award would start developing their applications these days, right? And back then, it wasn't different. Uh, what they realized is that by using this approach, they, they, they saw that the database was not keeping up with the volume, right? Because... Uh, there is a small number of transactional events. Uh, by transactional events, I'm referring to this data like customers, products, or uh, things that are uh, not 
change a lot or doesn't happen a lot. They're basically static data, right? And there's a huge considerable amount of non-transactional events or just events, as we could call it, right? That the database was not keeping up, right? Um, so the reality is that for that type of system, databases are not appropriate, right? You should think about how databases used to be like three years ago. It was, it was just like this, right? But these days when we are building microservices that has to handle like huge amount of data, has to be horizontally scalable and all of that, databases are not keeping up. I'm, I'm not saying that databases are bad, right? Uh, there's a very good databases out there. The reality is that there are some problems that databases only cannot be solved anymore, right? And the reality is that databases are limited, right? Uh, a while some people might uh, defer from this from this uh, statement, right? The reality is that databases are limited because think about this: what reason, what other reason for a database be limited? Because we have to this this process of reading from the transactional databases and move to a very dedicated uh, database only for the purpose of doing analytics, right? If the databases were not limited, we should we should be able, right? That's the statement. We should be able to run analytics on top of the transactional databases, right? But if you do this, what's going to happen is that the data, transactional database is going to slow down, right? And that's the limitation is all about, right? So uh, the realization that the guys from LinkedIn uh, came is that, all right, let's, let me go back to this picture over here and then I can explain better. So. Behind every database, there's this concept of log, right? And this, this is basically any district that sees some paper will touch base the concept of logs, right? So the, the this paper here specifically talks about that the, the truth is the log, right? The database is basically a cache and comprised of a subset of that log. So all databases organize that data in the logs, the data structure, right? And what the tables does is to periodically kind of read chunks of that log and materialize in memory for read consumption, right? That, that's what database does, basically, right? So what LinkedIn did back then is that they kind of uh, got rid of the whole concept of database per se, right? So specifically the concept of tables, right? That let's get rid of tables and let's write code specifically for the data structure that is behind tables, which is the log, right? And conceptually, the log is a very simple data structure. It basically is a sequential set of data where new data always goes to the tail of the log, right? And from time to time, you might have concurrent readers, right? And one of the beauties of this um, architecture is that no matter how many concurrent readers you might have, the latency or the performance of each read is going to be constant time, right? Because Basically, all the readers are referring to a specific piece of data given the position of the data in the log, right? For, for those of you that know very well data structures, think about an array, right? Why reading an array uh, is constant time? Because given the index of the array, you go straight to the position where the data is located, so it is constant time if, if you know where the data is, right? Here's the same concept, right? We just don't refer to indexes, but we call those in a log architect, we call those offsets. If you know the offset of a given piece of information, you can move the offset on the log specifically then, and then you can read it, right? It's just extremely scalable, right? So this is basically what the LinkedIn folks did on the past, and they built this, what they call commit log, right? They've augmented the concept of log for a commit log because now this log has to be kind of a distributed, right? For, for handles things like scalability and fault tolerance, right? And then there's the second passage of the book where Jay Crab said, we've come to think of Kafka as a streaming platform, right? So a system that lets you publish subscribe to streams of data, but not only that, right? Uh, um, until there, you might remember on the messaging technology. A messaging technology, that's what it does, right? It lets you publish and subscribe to streams of data. But Kafka allows you to store the data, right? Right here. And to process the data. And this is exactly what Apache Kafka is built to be, right? So the reality is that if we kind of join the best and uh, the best things about each architecture for databases, what they do best, right? They're highly scalable, they're durable, they're persistent, and it provides ordering, right? And messaging technology, what they do best, they, be they basically provide low latency, right? They're fast, right? And if we take aside all the bad things about databases and messaging system, we're going to end up with a thing called distributed commute log, right? This is basically what Apache Kafka is in essence, okay? This is the philosophy about behind Kafka. 
It is thing that is highly scalable, durable, persistent in order, and it's fast. But remember that description from Jay Krantz, he said, all right, it is a system that lets you publish and describe and store data, right? But also it lets you process them, right? So if you have a platform, a distributed commit log that offers you all the capabilities of uh, processing streams of data and store them, this is what basically what we have right now. Uh, we can store them because it provides persistency capabilities, right? But what about processing the data? That's the beauty of using streaming data architectures that you have to be able that as the data happens, you have to be able to plug what we call processors or stream processors. We're not talking about this later on. And then everything, every new data that arrives, you can actually process them as they happen. You don't need to actually wait until the data is stored until you actually to start acting upon that data, right? So this is where the part, if you add stream processing capabilities and scalable integration, remember the Kafka Connect session that I've just did? So this is the arena of scalable integration, right? We're gonna talk this uh, more about this uh, in a moment. But now if you, if, you, if you group all these capabilities, you're not talking about something, a technology that everybody else, right? This is not a, a, a accepted, commonly accepted term, right? But it's becoming common and common for other companies to call this a distributed streaming platform, right? And if you were in Apache Core, right? So it is all about Apache uh, software technologies. If you go to the Kafka website right now in Apache, you're gonna see that right below the logo of Kafka, this is the description of what Kafka is. So as you can see here, right off the bat, the Apache website is telling you upfront what Kafka is. So this is the expectation that you should have on top of Kafka, right? So Kafka is not a messaging technology for, for, for crying out loud. It is a distributed streaming platform. And this might answer a little bit. Um, I, I've, I've been working for Kafka for some, some time now. And one of the main uh, criticisms and complaints that I've heard from developers, uh, as a developer advocate, I've talked with a lot of developers all the world. So, uh, one of the main criticisms is that, oh, Kafka is so much complicated compared to other messaging systems, such as, for example, RapidMQ or ActiveMQ or Tibco or any other messaging system, you name it, right? So there are, yeah, right, I give you that. Yeah, Kafka is uh, a little bit more complicated than other messaging systems, but there's a reason. There's a fundamental reason for this because Kafka was built to be a distributed streaming platform, right? If you know this, if you set this expectation in your head, Right off, right off the bat, right? You're actually going to afford that complexity easier, right? Uh, all right, it, there is a, a, an inherent complexity that comes with Kafka, right? But the reality is that it is a complexity that you should expect, right? It's just like you, you cannot compare, for example, how to deploy and manage a database to how to deploy and manage a messaging system because they're, those are two different technologies, right? This is the same happens with Kafka when you start comparing with uh, other messaging technology, you should not uh, set you, sh you should not set the same expectations, right? And then this is the third and last uh, passage from the book Kafka: The Definitive Guide that has been said by Jay Kraft, where he said the ability to combine these three areas to bring all the streams of data together across all the use cases is what makes the idea of a streaming platform so appealing to people, right? And if you think about it, I'm not sure if you asked your question, this question before, but why Kafka has been coming so popular in the last five years, right? I'm pretty sure that you've heard that, right, every new developer these days are basically using Kafka for doing something. Uh, every new applications are basically relying on Kafka for doing what they have to do. So why, why, why this popularity of Kafka is coming from? It's coming from the, the vision that the creators of Kafka had like when they were building LinkedIn, like probably more than 10 years ago right now. Uh, it became these days a tendency and a reality that most developers are actually uh, in need. Uh, the need for handling data, not using databases, not using messaging, but use streaming platforms, right? So streaming platforms are becoming very popular these days, right? And of course, this presentation is all about Kafka because Kafka, it is my background. This is where I'm probably best at it. But there are other distributed streaming platforms out there, right? For an Apache as well, there's Apache Pulsar, which is a very good piece of technology that uh, it does 
conceptually and virtually pretty much what the Kafka does as well. Uh, it is not so common and uh, that doesn't have the same uh, wider community that Kafka created for, for the last five years, but is a very decent piece of technology, right? So Apache Pulsar is something that probably will catch on uh, on the next years, right? And there's a whole, whole bunch of other technologies that not from Apache, but are either open source project from other vendors or perhaps some cloud services from vendors such as uh, Azure, AWS, or Google. So all of them, they probably have some string services. So just to give an, uh, an example of a few of them, AWS has Kinesis and uh, a managed version of for Kafka as well. Uh, Azure has even hubs. Uh, Google has Google Pub Sub. So all of those are streaming technology. So just, this is only for you just to understand that, yeah, so streaming technologies are catching on. So you as a developer should be uh, at least more interested on this type of technology, right? Kafka is probably one of the best one of them, uh, but the reality is that there's others. So you should pursue this uh, path of learning more about streaming technologies, right? So now that we've discussed uh, the origins of Kafka and we came to a realization that Kafka is not a messaging technology, it's a streaming data platform, right? We can start discussing some of the uh, uh, specific capabilities of Kafka, right? So what I'm going to expand the next like 20 minutes is to explain a little bit about uh, the, what I call the three main pillars of a distributed streaming platform, which is the ability for the streaming platform to handle data streams like messaging, the ability to handle data analytics or stream processing, right? And use the streaming platform as a storage system, right? A system that allows you to store data, preferably. Okay, so let's start by discussing data streams um, in, in the context of messaging, right? So, Let's, if we think about it, how messaging technologies works out there, you name it. It doesn't, I'm not referring to any specific messaging technology, but all messaging technologies are comprised by three main building blocks, right? There's this producer that writes data. There's the broker that receives the data that has been written by the producer, right? And there's a consumer that basically uh, receives the data that originally has been written by the producer, but the broker actually delivers the data to the consumer, right? All of the technologies are there uses this architectural called pushing model, right? Why does this push? Because it is the responsibility of the broker to actually get the data that has been received by the producer, temporarily store the data somehow, and by the time the consumer asks for it, it's going to, the broker is going to push the data down to the consumers, right? So in the end of the day, it's all about the broker, the responsibility to actually deliver the data to the consumers, right? What that means to us is that eventually the broker might become a bottleneck, right? This is why if you have worked with some other technologies in the past, such as uh, RapidMQ or AppMQ, you might have reached some bottleneck scenarios where the broker could simply not scale out anymore. It became the bottleneck, right? So it compromised things like throughput, but when compared to Kafka, like any other messaging technology kind of a, take a very serious beat from Kafka because Kafka somehow is able to provide way more throughput than the other messaging technology. And here's the reason, because in Kafka, there is no push model. There is a pull model, right? What that means is that it is not the broker in Kafka that actually pushes the data down to the consumer, but in reality, it is the consumer that actually established TCP connections with the Kafka broker and pulls the data out, right? So in other words, if the number of the volume, the data volume grows, right? For the Kafka broker, it won't make any difference. The only thing that the Kafka broker needs to be able to do is to be able to establish as many TCP connections as possible, right? So if you're talking about operating systems, uh, this means increasing the number of file handles can, that can be opened simultaneously, right? As well as you can have you can scale the number of consumers for a very, very high number, right? So this is one of the reasons why it does make a difference for, for example, any other messaging technology, if they have one, 10, 100, or 1,000 of consumers concurrently. And for Kafka, you can, it doesn't make any difference, at least not, uh, I'm gonna talk about this scalability uh, reasoning uh, later on, but 
it doesn't make so many difference if you have hundreds, thousands of hundreds of thousands of consumers concurrently, right? Because Kafka can handle this, right? It's all about networking, less than about the, uh, the broker uh, spending some of these resources to actually pushing data down to the consumers, right? So this is one of the good things. Uh, another aspect about Kafka is that uh, Kafka, it, it might not look like, right? Because Kafka has this naming convention called everything for Kafka are topics, right? So basically topics are the unit where you're gonna start in, right? Uh, it, it might not look like, especially if you come from the JMS world where the name topic means that you are going to do a pub sub, right? Like publish and subscribe to many uh, consumers, right? But it might not look like that Kafka doesn't provide queuing support, but it does, right? Everything in Kafka is about, is about this concept of groups. If you put a bunch of consumers sharing a property called group identifier or group ID, right? Well, in other words, if the, all of them belong to the same group, they're all actually going to queue it up, bro. So they're going to load balance themselves to process the messages, right? So in other words, uh, only one consumer at a time will process records, right? Not all of them. There won't be any broadcast of the message for the consumers within a group, right? However, if you put your consumers on different groups, this is going to be a pub sub, right? So whatever record has been stored here in the broker, if we won't pull, this guy is going to receive a copy of the data as well as the copy of the data for this one, right? So there are ways to implement both PubSub and QE in Kafka, right? And Kafka does something very, very uh, important, that concept called partitioning, which is how Kafka is going to scale out, right? Uh, partitions are probably one of the best conventions, naming conventions that I've seen out there. Um, for example, for those of you that has Elasticsearch background, you might be familiar with the concept of shards in Elasticsearch. So basically an index is broken down into multiple shards and each shard lives in a given uh, server or JVM or process, right? Elasticsearch server. Uh, and Kafka, it doesn't use the name shards, but it has the same effect, right? In, in Kafka, a topic is broken down into multiple partitions. And the reason why I like the name partitions is because partitions uh, makes me remember the concept of parts, right? So basically you, you picked up a topic and broken down into multiple parts, right? And those parts are going to be spread over the cluster, right? So that's this is how Kafka addresses uh, scalability, right? If you put as many brokers in a cluster as you might, you might need, this, uh, let's go, spreading of parts is gonna happen automatically for you. So you, you don't need to control all this, right? Uh, and each one of the consumers is going to read from one given partition at a time. So this is uh, this is how I mentioned previously that it doesn't make any difference for Kafka if you're handle if you're handling hundreds of thousands of concurrent consumers at a time. As as much you have partitions enough to for each one of these consumers, you might be able to serve right each one of these consumers right in a right concurrently right. So none of them will actually concur the, the resources from the Kafka broker in order to achieve, uh, receive the records, right? So it is all about you have the enough number of partitions in your Kafka cluster to serve all the consumers, right? If you have fewer partitions and more consumers, obviously it's going to work, but then the consumers are going to kind of uh, uh, work through the number of partitions and you won't, you won't have the actual parallelism that you should have in a Kafka cluster, right? And for the producer side, Kafka provides some very unique ways for you to decide which partition or which part of the topic you are going to write the data, right? So Kafka uh, is just like a NoSQL database. It has a key value, right? Each record is composed by a key and a value. Although it is most commonly uh, developers kind of write code to produce data without a key, just the value, right? If you specify a key, you're actually going to control a little bit more which partition uh, the data is going to be written, right? So you, how would we accomplish this? Using the concept of keys. And one of the cool things about Kafka as well is that Kafka has no format, it's a schemaless, right? Everything in Kafka is an array of bytes. Because of this, uh, the producer can pretty much write and serialize any type of format it, they want it. 
And the consumers, uh, they can pull and deserialize any type of format, right? So this is cool because it gives you the ability for multiple programming languages to share and consume data simultaneously, right? You can easily like serialize something using .NET uh, and write into Kafka, and then you can have a consumer written in Java or Python or Go or any other programming language and deserialize the same data and being able to handle that data efficiently, right? So in order to accomplish this, what you have to do is to rely on this concept of serialization and deserialization. So you have, uh, ultimately, you, you have to, your producer and consumers are going to use some sort of uh, format, right? For example, they can decide to use Protobuf, right? Uh, so it's gonna be the, up to the producer to use some serializer that can pick up the data in Protobuf and transform to the array of bytes that Kafka expects, right? As well as the consumer, needs to be able to deserialize data from the array of bytes into the protobuf format, right? so they can start acting upon the data, right? But the reality is that this is possible, so this is good. And one of the key things about Kafka is that Kafka data is all persistent. So persistency in Kafka is interesting because it is not something that you can disable, right? Different from some messaging technology, for example, that, uh, yeah, data is persistent, but persistency is a feature, right? You to go on and off, right? And Kafka, all the data is persistent. They expire eventually because it has a, a retention period by default is seven days. But if you want the data to actually live for three months or a year, just set the retention data is a per topic to, to, to that duration. So uh, it's going to be persistent for up there, right? Uh, another aspect from Kafka is the ability to provide stream processing capabilities, right? So stream processing came from the need right, for how do you actually do computation with Kafka? So basically you would have to write a consumer that periodically pulls data from the broker and bring the data in to its own cache or memory or somewhere where the data can be available for, for, for processing purposes. And then you gotta do the processing, right? So for example, you're gonna filter all the records that has is less than four or maybe the records that are more than five. So the result of that processing the common technique is to write the results back into Kafka, likely in another topic, right? Let's call, there, there was the input topic and there was the output topic, right? So the results of the processing would be written into the output topic, right? So any application that is interested on the, not on the raw data, but the data computed would read or pull data straight from the output topic, right? But the reality is that, uh, making this process work scal scalably is very complicated because there's too much code to write. Right? So that's why in the Kafka ecosystem, they decided to provide a framework to do all this process of the process here. And then they end up with something called stream processors, right? So stream processors are basically frameworks or SDKs or just technologies out there that allows you to concentrate your logic of processing the data without necessarily having to handle the whole plumbing of Kafka. For example, you don't have to handle details of partitioning or fade over or fault tolerance or how the serialization works, things like that are very abstracted away from the developer, right? So there will be still the producers writing the data, the consumers uh, reading the data. And in between, we might have stream processor that will hook up into the Kafka cluster and then they will be concurrently as the data happens or as the data flows the brokers or the Kafka cluster, they will process them and flush the results out into output topics, right? Uh, namely, there are two main technologies that you can use for implementing your own stream processor. The first and most obvious one is what comes with Kafka uh, out of the box. And as part of the Kafka uh, framework, you have this guy called Kafka Streams, right? Which is basically a Java or JVM compatible library that you can implement a code similar to this one over here. For example, wow, what a filter, all the red uh, squares over here. So this is probably the type of code you would have to write in Java in order to make that happen, right? And then there was also this uh, implementation call, is an open source project all as well, called KSQL DB that basically it provides an abstraction layer that has been built on top of Kafka Streams. So ultimately, it is all Kafka Streams running, running underneath. But for the developer standpoint, you can actually express your stream processing using this SQL 
type of language, right? KCQDB is a fairly new project. It, it's a very good one. It is being maintained. It's not from Apache, but it's being maintained and is uh, developed by Confluent, right? So ultimately, it's not available on the Apache license, the 2.0 license, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, there are other frameworks that can be used as stream processors as well, which is are equally powerful, uh, arguably sometimes even better than uh, KSQLDB, which is Apache Flink, for example. Apache Flink is a more mature stream processing framework that has been around for some time, right? Uh, and has some capabilities that KSQLDB is catching up, right, very quickly. But if you if all you need is a very mature implementation on top of some stream processing framework that allows you to not concentrate of oh yeah we have to kind of create a workaround because this is not supported yet Apache Flink might be your thing right or Kafka Streams because Kafka Streams is a very mature project as well right uh, and then there is this concept of scalable data integration so scalable data integration and Kafka is handled by this framework called Kafka Connect right which I've just delivered a presentation showing you how to write your own connector for. Right? Kafka Connect, basically the job of Kafka Connect is to have this concept of connectors, which basically is going to allow you to read the data from the brokers or from Kafka and for send somewhere else. For example, oh, I want to, want to read data from the Kafka broker and then maybe write into uh, Elasticsearch. Right? So Elasticsearch is a NoSQL database, as you know it. So if you want to do this, you can use connectors for Kafka, or maybe it's the inverse, right? You, you have data available on Elasticsearch, and you can use one of these connectors for reading data from, from Elasticsearch and bring into Kafka, right? Oh, why you do this, Ricardo? Oh, maybe because the data that is available in Elasticsearch, you want to make available for somewhere else, right? That And that somewhere else doesn't necessarily has the ability or cannot or should not read directly from Elasticsearch for some reason. I don't know. I can't think of any motive for this because Elasticsearch is a pretty open uh, framework as well. But you can do this using Kafka if you want it, right? And then let's talk about, uh, we have about three minutes until our Q&A. This is our last topic about uh, the structure of Kafka, which is Kafka as a storage system, right? So one of the things you have to know about Kafka is that Kafka currently, right, uh, October 2020, Currently, Kafka uses the storage system that is based on a virtual storage layer that is composed by all the Kafka brokers, right? So if you want to have one Kafka broker that has one terabyte of storage, and if you put the same Kafka broker in a cluster with another Kafka broker with 1.5 terabytes of storage, they're going to form a theoretical 2.5 terabytes of storage Kafka cluster, right? So if you come from Redoop, Apache Hadoop, this is the same storage implementation that arguably Kafka kind of a, was inspired on Hadoop when they came up with this uh, approach uh, when he was originally created. So keep that in mind. That's how you kind of increase elastically storage of your Kafka cluster, right? What I, I mentioned that uh, this is right now because Kafka has in place some, something called a tiered storage. There's a Kafka improvement proposal for implementing something that Apache Pulsar has already in place, which is... Uh, they kind of separate the storage layer into a more permanent storage layer, uh, usually based on Apache Bookkeeper, right? Which is pretty cool. So you can have a cold, hot, and cold storage, and it, it, you can kind of grow more economically uh, efficiently your Kafka cluster. So in other words, if you want to want to grow your storage, you don't necessarily have to put more compute. You just put more storage. So this is one of the drawbacks from Kafka right now. So. Keep that in mind when you are sizing your Kafka cluster, right? And remember when I was explaining about partitions, right? Partitions is how Kafka addresses the scalability. Each partition in a Kafka cluster can also have replicas, right? So those replicas are going to be spread also in a Kafka cluster, preferably in a different broker that is not where the primary partition is running for failover purposes. So if you ever lose a partition, that partition can actually be restored for another broker, right? And Kafka storage system is constant time. As I mentioned before, remember the example of the array and indexes, right? So it doesn't make any difference if you're handling in Kafka five kilobytes of data or five terabytes of data. If you ever have to read like 100 records, uh, the, the, the time spent for, for that is going to be the same, right? And finally, 
This is one of the key things about Kafka, but how, why Kafka is so fast? Because Kafka serves all the data from the page cache. So remember when I mentioned that Kafka is persistent by nature? So all the data is kind of a stored in a file system, right? In a bunch of files called segments. And a copy of those segments is kind of a reading up into the, the main memory from the operating system, which is the page cache, right? Every time a consumer tries to pull the data, the data is served directly from the page cache. So optimization number one. Optimization number two, Kafka has this, makes heavily used the send file API, which basically does a bypass of the kernel space and basically serve the data directly to the network socket buffer, which in turn came directly from the page cache. So for those of you that know what send file API does, it basically bypass all the copies that the kernel needs to do every time it will serve some data that is on the application layer to the network card layer. So this is why one of the reasons Kafka provides a very good throughput. Um, I think we're running out of time. And luckily, this is actually the, the last thing I would like to share about Kafka. So I'm gonna stop presenting right now and take a look on the chat for a second. If there are any questions. So let's spend about, let's spend the next five minutes uh, with any questions that you might have. Okay, so let me take a look at the chat. Oh, for now, there's only Felix comments, okay. Okay, so if you have, if you have any questions, feel free to ask right now. Um, I'm gonna be around available for, for any questions you might have, uh, but hopefully you, um, you were able to understand about a little bit more about how Kafka works and what Kafka really is. I think the, 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 the main value of this presentation is for you to understand what Kafka really is and what expectations you should have around Kafka because um, it is an amazing technology, but sometimes is uh, misinterpreted. Okay, so Andy has a question. You mentioned KSQLDB. How, how does that compare with Kafka plus Flink SQL, for example, uh, it is it is basically a, a equivalent approach um, because Flink SQL is basically running on this their own infrastructure that connects to Kafka, right? So KSQL DB has the same approach. You would have your own KSQL DB infrastructure, right, which is connecting to Kafka to do the processing, right? But I would say that Flink SQL is a, a bit more mature than KSQL DB, right? But fundamentally, they offer the same thing, right? They, they basically do the same job, right? Uh, can you please explain why the throughput of Kafka is independent of the number of records being requested? Um, okay, so when I, when I mentioned that, I was referring for the constant time performance. So what I was mentioning is, what, if you have a database, right, for example, let's compare with the database. If you have five kilobytes of data stored on the database, right, reading one record from the database is going to be fast, okay? If you have five terabytes stored in the database, if you try to read one record from the database, it's going to be a little slower, okay? So, in other words, the, the volume of the data storage is going to impact the performance of one individual request in a database. In Kafka, this doesn't happen, right? So. What I've mentioned is that in the, regardless of the, the data volume, reading one record, right? That's the key thing. One record in five kilobytes and one record in five terabytes, the performance is going to be the same because it's constant time based on the offset. If you know the offset of the data, the log has been positioned there and you just read. So it, it, it doesn't matter how much data you have stored. That's what I meant to do, meant to say. Okay, um, anything you have to add about data flow management orchestration? Any need to manage back pressure, for example, like DiFi? Yes, uh, Lauren. So, back pressure is probably one of the main uh, characteristics that Kafka doesn't provide out of the box that I've seen many developers complaining about it, uh, mostly because it's kind of a good problem to have. Like, Kafka is so performance and being able to deliver data so fast that sometimes the downstream system cannot keep up with the throughput that Kafka is delivering, right? And 
Employment back pressure techniques is something that, yes, you should be aware about. And Kafka doesn't provide a very good story about it so far uh, because it's all about the, all, all up to the consumers to kind of uh, pull the data uh, and, and the frequency that they can handle it, right? So it's, yeah, that's a good question. Okay. This is a similar, okay. What are the main Kafka production bottlenecks pitfall? Apache Pulsar is a great alternative. Uh, Matil, yeah, Apache Pulsar, Apache Pulsar is a great alternative. That's for sure. That's a given. Uh, I would say that Kafka, I mean, usually what the, the main problems of scalability of Kafka is not sizing properly the number of partitions, right? That's number one. Number two, uh, Kafka architecture is extremely disk I.O. bound and network I.O. bound, right? It is it's way less about CPU and memory, right? So with that said, uh, what I've seen out there is that most Kafka deployments not uh, sizing properly the infrastructure layer, thinking about disk and network performance, right? So if you're in if you're from the infrastructure background, you know that you have to serious consideration when regards networking. So that's something that makes a difference in the Kafka cluster. Um, but yeah, Kafka, Pulsar is, Great alternative. Can I use Kafka to build pipeline between cloud and prime data center? Yes, those Yes, definitely. This is a very popular use case from Kafka, and primarily because Kafka can plug in into and pass through firewalls very easily because it's TCP based, and also it provides very res resiliency for the data. So yeah. Uh, and matter of fact, there's a lot of migration scenarios from. Uh, uh, leaving one cloud provider to another using Kafka for this. So, yeah. I have a doubt about testing those string processors. For microservice, for instance, we can apply content driven testing to kind of integration testing of the without a full deploy of uh, Borgia. I don't think I followed your question. Sorry. Okay. So, there's a continuation. Build. Sorry. I said without finishing the question. Is there a good approach of events and stream processor, or is it important to the test? Yes, yes, no, definitely. Contract driven development still applies for stream processors. Basically, uh, if you're building an API that has to obey a contract, uh, yeah, your, your stream processor definitely have to follow that design. And there is some testing frameworks that you can use in order to help with that as well. So, that, but yeah, the concern applies. Your stream processors needs to follow a contract-driven de design. Uh, Jens, what does it make sense to use Kafka on single computer node? Thinking of edge computing processing data from production machines. Uh, Jens, let me put this way: it technically works, right? But I think it will be preferable if you use a more lightweight broker technology such as MQTT, right? And why is that? Uh, because Kafka is an extremely disk-driven, disk I.O. Disk bound and network I.O. bound. And in the edge or in the fog, as we call it, is not a very kind of an interesting technology to have. So I, I would bet on more lightweight broker technologies such as MQTT, for example. And then there's a question here from Dion Jaidian on Pulsar, since they are similar and now under Apache Software Foundation, are they likely to merge at some point in the future? Uh, I, Juden, I really don't know, but uh, that's a very interesting question because they have, they definitely share similarities. I, if I would bet right now, I would say, no, that's very unlikely mostly because there are different code bases, right? And because of the different code base, merging this type of project is not a very easy task, right? So it's more about the amount of work that you would have for merging those projects than actually if, if it makes sense or not. Yes, it does make sense, right? But yeah, the, I think the merge would be very complicated to have. I think I've answering all the questions, but if someone has another one, feel free to shoot. Let me just see if I haven't. Oh, Lauren has one. Anything you have to say about time windowing? Uh, okay, yeah. So Lauren asked about time windows. So time windows is something that you can implement using Kafka Streams and KSQLDB. 
or Apache Flink as well. So usually all those three frameworks does very good support for time windowing, for example, uh, tumbling windows, session windows, hoping windows. So yeah, windowing is something that definitely you have to use a string processor framework for it, right? Uh, the client's API from Kafka doesn't support for this. So this is something you would find natively on the string processor frameworks. Um, and then Andy asked, any guess on the timeline for the Kip tiered storage? Andy, I had hopes that the tiered storage would come by the end of this year, right? But the reality is that they're still under discussion, right? Um, and if, if I it could provide some advice, uh, this is something that, that I've done for some time, is that there is the uh, Apache Kafka mailing list where you can subscribe and follow up with the KIP uh, more often instead of going to the JIRA and then just see the status of the approach. So what I have seen, it, and I've just read uh, the discussion recently, they're still discussing like uh, implementation details of the KIP. So my expectation is that it may, may take some time based on that because otherwise they would be discussing something like, uh, okay, the code is done and that just merge the code. So that type of discussion hasn't been, I, have, I haven't seen so far. Yeah, that's the reality. Uh, what's your opinion about KSQL and experience prediction? Uh, Luis, yeah, KSQL is a former name. Now it's called KSQL DB. It's a very good technology, right? Um, it yes, definitely has a lot of. Uh, I've seen a lot of people using it in production. It works fine. I um, but so yeah. Uh, I, if I were you, I should give a try in KSQL DB. It's now it's under KSQL DB dot io. Just use this website. Is there? Uh, does Kafka Streams run on the same JVM as the Kafka Broker? Nope. Yeah. So you answer your own question. So Nicholas. Kafka streams, just like KSQL DB, they run on their dedicated set of JVMs that is outside the Kafka broker, right? Uh, this is important because Kafka is extremely IO bound and Kafka streams and KSQL DB are extremely CPU bound. So it is a good thing to separate the workloads. Of course, technically you can run both at the same machine, but uh, because of those hardware characteristics it's better to separate the workloads for better performance and resource utilization. Which streaming solution is better for writing da data from Kafka to IgniteDB? Um, from Kafka to IgniteDB, IgniteDB, uh, it is Apache Ignite, if uh, in those, that's that's the one you are asking. I, I, if it is, I, I know Apache Ignite for being this uh, in-memory data grid, in-memory database technology, which is, Looks like a lot with a NoSQL database. If that's the case, I would recommend taking a look on Kafka Connect, which is, remember the scalable integration part that I mentioned before? So I know that Apache Ignite has a connector for it that you can simply deploy, and then it, it would continuously reading data from Kafka and then sending to Apache Ignite. So if that's what you're talking about, the, I don't know any other Ignite DB out there other than the Apache Ignite. So. Yeah. You're welcome, Andy. No worries. My pleasure. Uh, so Haru has a, when you say that the broker caches partitions, are you talking about a file system cache? Yes, how I was talking about the file system cache. So the page cache, every file that the operating system flushes into, every file that the operating system handles, it flushes into disk and makes a copy of that file on the page cache, which is has a watermark of 85% of your virtual available memory, right? So yeah, won't, so this is the file system cache. So yeah, if yes, won't large memory mapped file calls heavy memory usage? Uh, yes, yes, it, it 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 will cause file heavy usage. That's for sure, and that's one of the reasons why when you are considering doing a sizing for Kafka, you have to think really really well in how much data each node individually 
is going to sustain, right? So you don't overpass that watermark of more than 85% of your available RAM memory, right? So obviously, if you are thinking about a cluster, for example, if you're thinking about storing in a given point in time one terabyte of data and you have four nodes, you might be kind of a reasoning to think that each one of those nodes might need to be able to handle 250 uh, gigabytes of uh, data, right, per node. Because remember, Kafka has elastic storage. And then if they ha need to handle 250 gigabytes of per node, you have to have at least the double of that memory per node. So this is more or less the reasoning that you should have. But you are right. If you pass through the watermark, you might have some very memory pressure problems that might, like you said, might trigger some alerts on the, on the system. You're welcome. Right, so um, I think we are running out of time. Um, if there are any, no more questions, um, I think we can wrap it up right now. I would like to uh, thank everybody that was with me all this time, uh, even though the one that came from the, the previous talk as well before. Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm available. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, you can reach me out uh, on my email or my Twitter handle and I will be more than glad to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.